hey, we're starting a new series today called On Your Mark. And I'm going to say On Your Mark, set go. And um, I'm, I was going to dress up today like a runner. And then I thought, nah, that's going to be terrible looking. So <laughs> I won't do that. <laughs> uh, you wouldn't hear a word that I said for laughing. But uh, so instead, I'm going to have Sarah dance. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> And so we're going to talk about on your mark, and set, go, and about our position that we're in and, and what God has called us to do in our life. And, uh, you know, I, I often think about when I see runners and they're in the blocks. And uh, if you, somebody asked me what the blocks were after last service, the blocks are when they're getting down in their stance and they're getting ready to run. And they're in the blocks and what they're thinking about. Now, for me... Uh, I, I think of all the things that they might be thinking about, like, like, can I beat the guy to my left? Can I beat the person to my right? All those things. But honestly, I think that if they're going to do what they came to do, they're thinking about finishing. And it's not about beating the other person as much as it is about finishing the race that they've started. Because in this race of life, it's not about, it's not about who gets there first, but it's about finishing you know in a, in a marathon there could be hundreds of people that are in this race and uh, some of the people that start in the race uh, many uh, start the race knowing that they're not going to be the first one across the finish line but their goal is not to be the first one but to finish and I, I, I think there needs to be an attitude or a place in our life that in that expectation that we're not here necessarily to be the fastest but to finish and to finish what God has already started in our lives. And I was thinking about when Jason was praying just a moment ago. And he said, put your hand on your heart and say, hey, what God's already started in me, he's going to finish. And I thought about what a great process or way to think about our finish is to know that we are running with the finisher. He's going to complete what he started all I have to do is connect to that. All I've got to do is be a part of that, and he will help me to reach my, my goal that he's taking me to. And, and, and what God has already started in us is uh, something that he um, believes in. He sees in us. He's created it in us, and he knows about already. And so uh, our expectation or our, our goal is to look to him and to use, uh, to, to know that he is going to use us in great and mighty ways. So we should have this expectation. Here's one of the expectations we should have. That expectation that we are led by the presence of God. Listen, everything in life is about the presence of God. You know, we don't, well, sometimes we don't even talk about this, but honestly, we connect to the presence of God because the presence of God is always available. We, we can live in that place of his presence. And the second thing that we, we should uh, understand is the power of God. That I'm not doing this on my own, but I'm living in the power of God. And that God lives in me. He, I am an overcomer because of the power of God in my life. And that Jesus came to this world and died for our sins. But it wasn't just to make our lives happier and healthier and holier. All those, those are awesome things. I, w I think we should be happy and we should be healthy and we should be holy. But I think even sometimes we get our eyes on the happy and the healthy and the holy and we forget that there's more, that there's more that God has in our life. Our goal should not be for us to get out of this world and get to heaven. Now, I want to go to heaven. How many wants to go to heaven in here? Okay, I'll pray for the rest of y'all. All right, let's try that one minute. How many want to go to heaven? There's an alternative, and I don't really want to go there. But my goal in life is not to get to heaven, but my goal in life is to bring heaven to earth. That should be my single purpose. And Jesus came into the world to transform the world. And how is he going to transform the world? It's by bringing heaven to to earth. Matthew 13 says this, talking about the mustard seed. He said, he put another parable before them saying, the kingdom of heaven is like the grain of mustard seed that a man took and he sowed it in the field and in, in its smallest of seed. But when it had grown, it was larger than the garden plant, all the garden plants and became a tree. And so that the birds of the air could come and make their nest in its branches. 
And he told another parable of the kingdom of heaven is like the leaven that a woman took and, and had, hid three measures of flour until it was all leavened. These two parables are about the tiny mustard seed and about the yeast was both teaching us the principle of the kingdom of heaven. That it starts with seemingly the smallest of things. The smallest of things. But when we activate the smallest of things and put them in their right perspective and their right purpose, they grow into something that out that's bigger than we can even imagine. Christianity for us is not a religion. And it has to be more than just a relationship. Now, I personally believe that, that everything that we do is, comes out of our relationship with God. I believe that everything that I am, everything that I'm going to be, everything that in my life comes out of my relationship with God. And so I, as much as I believe that, I believe that Christianity is not just religion. It's not a religion. It's not just a relationship, but it's a movement. It, it's a movement. It's the power of God working in us. You know, God didn't just save us and fill us with his spirit just to, just to keep us out of uh, of. of trouble but he saved us and filled us with his spirit so that we could change the world around us and jesus had the responsibility handed over the responsibility of this movement to us now let's just think about this if i were if i were god i would have had jesus after his resurrection do a world tour and go around from city to city showing people his hands and his feet and saying look i'm the risen christ and you might make believers you make some believers quick right but he didn't do that. Instead, Jesus said, I'm going to go away to prepare a place for you. But the same power that was in me, I'm going to put that power in you so that you can go change the world. He understood that the greatest plan was to empower, empower the disciples and to empower us to be world changers. I want you to say to your neighbor today, you're a world changer. Come on, look at your other person next to you and say it with a little more compassion or a little more fire, something. You're a world changer. You are a world changer. You know, Christianity, when it gets kind of just going through the motions, you click on your phone that you came to church on Sunday morning so everybody knows that you're a good Christian, that you showed up at church, and, and you just go through the motions. It gets real stale. Christianity gets to be like, okay, so why am I going to church today? Now, I, I know most pastors might not say this, but look, you know, you might as well go to the river. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you know, if you're sitting in church and wishing you were somewhere else, if church just becomes the thing that I do because my mom did it, my grandma did it, and if I don't do it, they're going to talk about me at Christmas. <laughs> then it becomes very stale. It's just another thing that we do, just another thing we check off of our list. It's another thing that, that, that that's we feel responsible for on the weekend. But so many times Christianity becomes boring to people is because they get saved and then they just sit. God didn't call us just to be, get saved and to sit. Everything he put in you was to pour out. If God's given you great wisdom, it's not so that you can be wiser than everyone else. Sit on your wisdom throne. Oh, look at me. I have great wisdom. But you don't have any friends. You have no one to share it with. Oh, I have great wisdom, or I have great understanding, or I have, uh, or God's given me the gift of healing. All of these things that God has given us was given to us so that we could pour out. Every Christian should have two testimonies in their life. What God saved them from and what God saved them for. What God saved them from and what God saved them for. I was thinking about this a moment ago, and I was thinking about, you know, if, and I'm not going to bore you with the details, but in my testimony, I was way away from God and blah, 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 you know. Did all the stuff that, you know, the world 
all of that goodness. But my wife, on the other hand, she lived a pretty good life. Never done anything really wrong. If we compare the notes of right and wrong, obviously I all think this anyway. She looks like an angel. And I look like the devil. But the truth of the matter is, is that it took the same cross, the same blood, the same confession of sin, the same Jesus, the same cross, to save both of us. And one day she had to give her life to Christ just like I did. And she had to have an encounter with him and build a relationship with him. It was required of both. And, and the fact of the matter is, I could say God saved me from drugs, but he saved her from drugs because she never did any. So we have to know, not only know what we're saved from, but we've got to know what we're saved for. As we've already stated in the baby dedication today, that we were born with purpose in our life. And that God didn't create any of us by accident. You've heard me say this a thousand times, but there's no illegitimate children. God didn't have an uh-oh moment when babies were born. Every child God knew before the worlds were framed. And when that child was conceived, he already had purpose for that child's life. It doesn't matter the home even that the child was brought up in. Now, we obviously know that it's awesome to bring a child up in a godly home and a, uh, where there's righteousness and all that. But I was just thinking about all of these little children that may have not had that great home. They were still born for purpose. They were still created for purpose. They still, God, when God put them on this earth, he already had a plan for their life and a purpose for their life. So when we know what we're saved from and we know what we're saved for, it gives us a testimony that we can share with everyone. In Acts 1 and 8, it says, But you shall receive power after that the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. You shall receive power. He didn't give us power just so that we could run around and say, Look how powerful I am. He gave us power so we could change the world. And when he gives us the power, then we're supposed to use what God put in us for the purpose of changing the world around us. It's like filling your car up with gas and parking it in the driveway. Like, hey, man, I got this awesome car. It's really nice. I got it parked in my garage. It never gets dirty. It's full of gas. Man, you ought to see it. Well, bring it to me. No, no, no. You got to come to my house and see it. What are you talking about? Well, I don't want to get it dirty. And, and besides that, I don't want to burn the gas that's in it. And, and I, it's really nice, and I, I might let you sit in it if you come by. So we got all of this greatness, but it's for no purpose at all. It has no purpose. It has no real, we don't have any real reason to have it, but when he filled us with his spirit. He not only filled us with the power of God, but he didn't say, hey, I'm just going to fill you with this power so you could sit around on it, wait on it, but I filled you with the power so you could go out and pour it out, pour it out pour it out so he gives us the power that we need to fulfill the calling of those things that he's called us to do power power of the holy spirit the holy spirit's role is to make sure that god's plan in the world becomes a reality the work of the holy spirit in our life is to give us the power and the grace to fulfill our calling. I don't have time to preach on this. It's another whole subject, but there's no greater teacher than you can have than the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. And when you, when you let the work of the Holy Spirit be alive in your life, it's a teacher. It teaches, it instructs, it gives out. But it doesn't give out for you just to keep. It gives out for you to pour out and to fulfill your destiny. I, I love kids, and, and I love to be around kids. I remember when we first started this church years ago and came to Hammond, and, and I, I was doing a lot of children's ministry, and we got this little raggedy van that had uh, from our church back home, and they hadn't used it in years. And when I tell you raggedy, 
I, I, I was praying that I'd get it here. I think I stopped three or four times, maybe more, just to fill it up with water. I put more water in it than I did gas getting it down here. <laughs> and um, it still had King's Temple. We, were, we didn't have enough money to even change the sign on the side of it. It had King's Temple, Shreveport, Louisiana. And we were driving around, picking up kids. And I would come in service. And we had, we, we'd sometimes, we'd feel that, we'd glad the police never stopped us. So we'd have that van just piled with kids, you know. And we'd make two or three runs. And we'd be 60, 70 kids some Sundays. And we only had like 20 people in the church that went to church there. But we was picking up all these kids. And uh, I would dress up like a clown. And I'd go out and, and, and do ministry with the kids and then I'd run in my office and back in those days we had you know we wore a suit because it made us holier <laughs> and I put my holiness on and um, we'd come out and and, and 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 do church a few years ago I pulled up to Domino's Pizza and this young man stuck his head out the window he must have been six plus and he just kept coming out the window I thought he was going to get in the car with me for a second He's like, hey, Pastor Poole, Pastor Poole, do you know me? Like, no, I don't know you. Sorry. He, so he told me his name, and he said, you picked me up when I was a little bitty kid on the bus route, and you used to bring me to church. And I'm living for God. I'm serving this church on the youth team and blah, 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 blah. He was so excited about the kingdom of God. Oftentimes, when God gives us this to pour out, we don't see the immediate fruit of it, and sometimes we may not see it at all. But God tells us to plant and to water, and he gives the increase. He gives us the power. He gives us the knowledge. He gives us the strength. He gives us the tools, and we're supposed to go and do what God has called us to do. And I want to say this today to all of our team from RFK. This week, the seed that you sowed you may not ever see the complete fruit of that. But what God put in those kids' heart this week will come to fruition. It will come to pass. Why? Because God's word is yea and amen. And somewhere in their lifetime, they'll look back and they'll remember the songs that they sang, the memory verses that they read. And I was thinking about those kids, thinking about Joseph this week, and they was going through all the things that Joseph had to go through in his life was the storyline this week, and, and he went from the pit to the palace and to the prison and back to the palace and all the things that happened in his life. And I was thinking about the goodness of God in our life because sometimes we feel like we're in the pit when God really is preparing us for the palace. But because we're so often caught up in the moment we're in, we forget our purpose. There's going to be times in life when you're in the pit. Don't forget God's called you to the palace. And keep your eyes on the Lord. Keep your eyes on the purpose of your calling. And don't look to the left or to the right, but say, Lord, this is what you've called me to do, and I'm not going to let my surroundings determine my future. And the Scripture said, and you will be my witnesses. I'll give you power, and you're going to be my witnesses. And that power is going to give you purpose in your life and you know, so many times uh, Christians are like bodybuilders. You know, they go to the spiritual gym and they work out and they flex their muscles and say, look at me, I came to church today. And they do a, one of the, those when they gave in the offering. <laughs> and if somebody happened to come with them to church, they kind of do. So they're posers, they're not really all of that. And they just kind of go through those bodybuilding, look at me. I had a friend one time, he worked on our staff years ago, and, and he was always lifting weights. And he'd always say to me, hey man, look at my arm. Feel that, come on, feel them guns. Feel those guns. I mean, all the time, like, come here, feel Today I ran five miles. Feel that. All right. One day we were working at the church, and I said, hey, bro, grab the end of that roll of carpet, and let's pack it out to the van, out to the truck. And he was over there, Ugh! I was like, dude, I have mine up on the end like this. Come on, let's go. 
Sometimes in life, we're just posers. We're always showing our muscles, but we're not doing the work that God's called us to do. When it gets time to do the heavy lifting, we just want to. You know, your body has muscle memory. And if you go to the gym every day and you lift the same weights, your muscles remember to lift those weights. You can go to church and you can lift the same muscles all the time, but when you get outside the church, your muscles don't have the memory to win the lost. It takes sometimes going and doing what you don't feel comfortable doing, and it creates a lifestyle of muscle memory that you start doing what God has called you to do because it becomes a lifestyle, not something that you just go do on occasion. It becomes your very life to tell others about what God has done in your life. It comes your life to share the gospel. It comes your life to tell people about the goodness of God. Can I get a better amen? amen. So God has called us to be these witnesses, and, and he, he gave us this great commission. He said, and the great commission is to go make disciples, not go have the largest church in town. God could care less about our numbers. We count every Sunday, and we know how many people that are here or how many that are not here. We do that because there's, we need to be able to build and to grow. And that's okay. There's even a book of numbers in the Bible. But God doesn't care about our numbers. God cares about our heart and our purpose of the kingdom. What are we doing with what God's put in us? God didn't just give you something just so you could hold on to it. He gave it to you to pour out. This is the race that you're running today. What is my purpose? This is the race that I am. This is what I'm called to do. And so God gives us a platform everywhere we go. Who's going to listen to us? Let me tell you what. Everybody wants to listen to what you have to say if you've got something to say. We get to drink coffee with people every day. We get to go to the shopping malls. We get to go to the stores. We get to go here. We get to go there. But one of the greatest places that we miss out is even our own family. How much time are we spending around our dinner table talking about the goodness of God? So... So as we pour out of our hearts and we give, 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 God rewards us. How does he reward us? By giving us a greater field. Giving us a greater opportunity. You said so good in that field, I'm going to give you a greater field. I'm going to give you a greater opportunity. There's a few things I want to talk about that's very important that we need in this race that we're going to run and it takes it takes discipline it takes you don't just get up and run a marathon tomorrow it takes some discipline in our life but there's some things that we need we need integrity we need integrity i need to i need to live and believe what i i I preach i need to live that and it takes a spirit of excellence i I could get on a soapbox here because we, we have we we need to have such a spirit of excellence in everything that we do Everything in our life should be a spirit of excellence. Why? Because God is excellent. God doesn't do anything half-heartedly. Everything that he does is excellent. And he wants us to be excellent as we reflect his goodness. And then relationships. You know, it don't really matter how much we know about God and how, how, how many words of wisdom we got and how scriptures we can quote and how many songs we can sing and how good we are at whatever we do. If we don't have relationships, then we're all alone. And it takes work to build relationships. It takes, it takes sometimes letting, you know, letting some things go in your own life to build relationships with people. So many times people think, I'm going to build me a house in the woods and I'm going to build a fence around it. I'm going to make sure that everybody knows not to come see me. We need to have our lives involved in other people's lives. This life is not my own. It's been bought with a price. It doesn't belong to me. And I need to be constantly trying to figure out a place to give it away. And it takes relationships to give that away. And so we need our houses to be places where people can come and sit and break bread with and, and build those relationships and love on people. And then some people say, well, I don't know what to preach or what to say or what to do. You know what? Everybody's got a story. Everybody's got a story. You can tell your story to anyone. You ain't got to be a great theologian to be a great witness. As a matter of fact, here's what I believe. If you walk up to somebody and start just quoting Scripture to them, they're going to probably go like, 
dude, get a life. But if you love people and you care about their needs and you care about what's going on in their life and then you tell them what God has done for you. Listen, you don't have to be a theologian to see someone in the wintertime that's cold and give them a coat. Or if they're hungry, give them bread. Or if they're thirsty, give them water. Or if they're in prison, go see them. You don't have to be a theologian to love people right where they're at. And sometimes they don't need those things in the natural, but they need relationships in the spiritual. They need relationships that they don't even know that they need. Some people can have all the money in the world and not have right relationships. They need someone to care about them and know that they matter. And when we come into the place that our life is not our own and we realize how much that, that, that we just really, really don't, this all belongs to God. Everything that I have, everything that I am, it all belongs to God. Then our life becomes a living testimony. And we can tell more people about what God has done in our life when we have a life that's transparent and honest and caring. I could talk today a long time about character, having your character right, living your life before men the way that you live it before God, or you should. And then I always talk about people don't come to church. You know why people don't come to church? Anybody know why people don't come to church? Because nobody ever invited them. And so many times people would love to come to church with you, but you never invited them. And I, I'm not picking on anyone this morning because my life is busy too, and I understand. But oftentimes we're like, hey, you know what? I was going to invite so-and-so to church, but, you know, my life is so busy. I had this going on and that going on, and then that was going to mean that I was going to have to change my schedule on Sunday, and we already had plans after church. If they came to church, then I'd have to go out to dinner with them. And then we talk ourselves right out of inviting someone into our life. So this is the race that God's called us to. For the team, you can come. So where do we start? Well, he says in Jerusalem, in Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the world. I believe this. I believe that this is a year that we said that the harbor's going to the nations. Now, when you, what do you mean when we say we're going to the nations? Are we talking about we're going to start having mission trips every week? No, I'm talking about our hearts are going to the nations. Everything that we do changes the world around us. Intercessors, when you pray, you shake the nations. When we give and we give to missions and we give to causes, we shake the nations. And then we do go. But first in Jerusalem. So here's how I want you to think about this today. What about the people in your life that you eat dinner with, that sleep in your home, every night can we start there can we start having the strong families time for prayer time for the word in your home time for the things of God hey listen I must confess that our lives get really busy I must confess with teenagers in my household all the busyness of life sometimes our kitchen's more like a like a drive through we cook a meal, people come in, they grab a bite to eat, they go out, they eat at different times. And before long, we don't really know where, you know, most of the time I know where they are because I got that little tracker on my phone. <laughs> where are they at? Did they go to work? Not that they're doing anything wrong, I just don't know where they're at. Because life is so busy. Can we stop? Think about what's most important. What's the most important things in our life? What's going to matter in eternity? All of the stuff in our life that we're involved in. Look, I'm not, I'm not saying this because I'm anti-kids playing sports and doing all those things. I'm, I'm for all that. Sometimes we get so busy, we got running them to soccer and running them to dance and running them to 
this and running them to that. They were worn out. We can stop for a moment, decide, hey, listen, what's most important? I'm even going to say this. Look, I, I, I spent a lot of money to put my kids in school, and I want them to have a good education. Well, here's the deal. If they know reading, writing, and arithmetic, and they don't know Jesus, I hadn't accomplished much. So my first place is in Jerusalem, my household. I want to be a father to my family, a spiritual leader, a priest over my home. I want to be connected to their life and what's going on in their life. I want to pour out the goodness of God that he's poured into me out to them. Second place is my city. I want to touch my city with the gospel of Jesus Christ. When I say my city, I'm not talking about Hammond. I'm talking about the places I live, the places I do life, the places I do commerce. I don't want to walk into the store so busy with life that I don't see nobody but my shopping list. Now, I have to confess, sometimes there's like, oh, Lord, I'm going to the grocery store, and I'm on a clock, and I hope I don't see nobody. <laughs> I told my wife just the other night, it's like, hey, listen, we need just three items. Let me go get it. You know why I'm saying that? Because she's going to shop for those three items and check all the prices. I'm just going to get whatever's first on the shelf and out the door and I said I'll be right back right back and I lit the grill and I ran to the store <laughs> about 45 minutes I came back the grill was already about ready to die because I ran into somebody at the store you know what we got to take time in life we can't be so busy with life that we pass people up we can't be so busy with life that in this race that we're running, this race becomes about me. Because he put us on this earth for purpose. And I don't have to get there the fastest. I've got to finish the strongest. I've got to fulfill what he's called me to do. And then to the nations and around the world. And God's called us to all these places to do all these great things. One of the greatest mission fields there is that we can, meet, we can overlook and I'm not just giving a plug for RFK, but sometimes we say, hey, Lord, send me to Africa. You can just go right out here to Montpelliard and do the work of God. Well, you know what? I don't know if I'm called to do that. Let someone else do it. You know, Mother Teresa did an awesome job, but she's not here today. Paul did a great job, but he's not here today. Whose race is it now? It's yours. The baton has been passed to you. And it's your race to run. It's your time. It's your moment to shine for the glory of God. It's your moment to fulfill the purpose of, that God has for your life. So today I want to encourage you. Get on your mark. Let's go change the world around us. Let's be everything that God has called us to be. Last thing I'm saying, and we get ready to pray. Oftentimes we're faced with adversity in our life and situations in our life. There's nothing the devil wants more than us to get introspective. Here's what I can promise you. If you'll pour out, you'll be healed. If you'll give, if you'll serve people, it'll change your life. If you want joy, give your car away.
If you want the supernatural in your life, serve others. You've got to change your life. I, prom- I guarantee you that. That's a promise. Because God wants to use what we have for his glory so he can give us more.